All righty. Good morning, guys. Welcome. Um, my name is Brendan Vanis. I'm the head of developer success for PlayFab, now part of Microsoft, as you probably heard. Um, I'm going to be giving you guys a talk today on live game operations in PlayFab. Um, and I'll explain the concept as we go along, but uh, to kick it off, I wanted to give you an idea of uh, some of the changes in the market over the years. So this is your, your projection from 2000, 2001. These are the top grossing games for those years. And you can see, if you look carefully at the list, there's only one game in the entire list that transitions from 2000 to 2001. But if you then project forward to the year when people born then are going to college, um, 2016 to 17, there's a huge difference here. I mean, if you go back to 2000, 2001, actually, there's, there's another aspect to it, too. Almost all of these are, are either, you know, PC games or console games of some kind, you know, handheld consoles of some type. Um, but if you look at the 2016 to 2017 chart, you're looking at almost entirely mobile games. And in fact, 70% of them were the same game from year to year. Now, there's a big reason for this. These games don't follow the old classic pattern of, you know, spike of usage and then drop off and long tail. These are games that use live ops. So live ops is all about re-engaging your users, getting them more excited about staying in your game, continuing to play your game, you know, for the long term. Um, some of the quotes we've heard, and there's a, uh, there's a live ops booklet that we did for this year. It contains a whole bunch of uh, best practices and discussions about different live ops. And uh, we talked to a lot of folks throughout the industry to pull this together. A couple of the key quotes that we got from doing that process were from uh, the Space Ape and the Nexon guys. So the Space Ape guys, you can see $80 million in revenue, and they're saying anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of that is directly attributable to their live ops programs. And then Nexon, of course, single biggest predictor of success in their games, they feel, is their live ops strategy. So you don't need to take their word for it. This is actual data from our service. So there's two games represented here. Uh, I'm not going to say what the first game was. If you meet me at a party, you're not going to get me to drink enough to tell you what the game is, because I don't talk about things that do poorly. <laughs> The, uh, the first game was a game, they, they actually had a, I, I shouldn't say poorly, they had an incredible launch. They were featured on iTunes, I think they were also featured on Google Play for that matter. So they went up to huge numbers of users. You can see here, they were over two and a half million DAU when they launched. And then they sort of sawtooth down, the spikes on the sawtooth were pretty much represent weekend days. Um, so they sawtooth down over time and it's a classic picture of a game that launches big numbers, fall off, long tail. Uh, the other game though, this one I will talk about, and you guys may have actually gone to their talk yesterday. The other game here is uh, Idle Miner Tycoon from Fluffy Fairy Games. Now they did a talk yesterday at 2 on their live op strategy in their games and what they're doing now and going forward with PlayFeb. And uh, if you didn't get to see it, obviously it'll be in the GDC vault later on, so you'll always be able to watch it there. But what they did was they took their concept and they did kind of an internal g game jam, really, and in eight weeks, just eight weeks of development, got their game onto iTunes and Google Play. And then they just iterated on it. They didn't do anything other than organic user acquisition. They just iterated on the game, uh, worked with their community to get feedback, you know, kept making updates and changing. And long about week 130, you can see there's a little dip there, and then they start climbing. That's where they enabled all the live ops that they'd been working on, all the things that they worked with us on, and things that they planned on their own. And you can see the growth just climbs and climbs and climbs, and it keeps going past that. Now, this was a, a garage studio that started out with just a few folks, and now they're doing exceptionally well. They've launched their second game, uh, Idle Miner Tycoon. And, uh, oh, excuse me, Idle Miner Tycoon was the first one. Idle Miner Factory is the second one. And, um, yeah, their, their chart, stretching it out past this, because we're a few weeks past this, keeps going in that direction. And it's all down to their live ops. So what, what exactly is live ops? And it's really, it's the changes that you make that are designed to boost your retention, monetization, basically just keeping your players excited and interested and personalizing their experience, doing things that take the aspects of the things that you're tracking on about your players and how they play your game and focusing any experiences that you then produce on things that you believe will appeal to those players based upon that information. So this is, a lot of this is around you know, like cosmetic items or uh, you know, user acquisition, limited time offers. Events, sales, things like that are good examples of live ops. What's not live ops is 
actual gameplay content. So if you're doing like new game modes, if you're doing new levels, that's not really live ops, but you can use live ops to enhance the performance of those. So a good example of that might be, uh, take your demo. You might have uh, a, a number of different ways that you want to demo the game to players. If you're doing, this is for a premium title in particular. So you might do, you know, uh, level one, two, three for some folks, or you might do level three, four, five for other folks. What you could do is you could create an A-B test in our system, and then just A-B test on that to see which one gets better conversion. If you see a definite difference between them, then obviously just collapse to that A-B version, and you're good to go. That way everybody's using that version. Hopefully you get better conversion because of that. So what does it take? So uh, in the old days, obviously a game was just a packaged good. You work with your publisher, you get it boxed up, you ship it to the market, you're done, you move on to the next game. With games as a service, what you're doing is you're, you're shipping your game out, but that's just like the beginning of your journey with your players. You're then operating the game, you're constantly updating it, you're monitoring it, you're taking feedback from your community. And within all of this, the most important aspect of it is making sure that you have the data in order to analyze the things that you're doing and see what's successful and what's not. This is kind of a, a, an overall map then of all of the back-end components that you use to run your game these days. Uh, down at the bottom, you've got the, the core game services, things like player data, logins, guilds, trading, you know, in-app purchasing, all that sort of thing. Uh, this is all stuff that we talked about in yesterday's talk. Uh, it's all very fundamental to your game, but realistically, all of that is kind of table stakes these days. It's things that are important, and you don't want your team to have to bother with them. Your team should be focused on the actual gameplay differentiators, the things that make people want to come back to your game over and over again, the things that make you unique. Um, but also around the, the sides of this, you see, once you've got all of these game services, you have to have them hosted somewhere. Uh, you're going to distribute through different channels, whether they are the different platforms, whether they are through Steam. Um, how you monetize your game, of course, is going to be important, and how you acquire your players. But up top, this is what we're talking about right now, uh, is your live ops tools, your analytics, everything that it flows into this concept of managing your game for the long term and keeping your players interested and hopefully maximizing your revenues. So the essential building blocks for all of this then are these. It's the BI, events, messaging, updates, store and catalog, promotions, customer service, and user acquisition. I'll go through all of these in brief but uh, the most important one of them is the BI. And actually, we, just to, to highlight it, we'll be talking again tomorrow afternoon specifically about real-time events within the system and how those work. So we'll get into more depth on that there. But in a nutshell, your real-time data is everything. Every single thing that goes on in your game. It's how you acquire your users, which ad campaigns are more successful. It's the game tuning that you do and how people respond to it. Hopefully using A-B tests so that you can try different experiments with it. See which things work better than others. Um, it's how you cross promote. So you're going to have multiple games over time. Um, being able to track upon all the users and using the data to say not just what games have they played before and so what games do I want to advertise to them. Obviously not a game they played before, but new ones. Uh, but also which games of the ones that you guys put out there are they more interested in. If you do both puzzle games and RPGs, and somebody plays all your puzzle games, the next time you put out a puzzle game, clearly you're going to want to send that ad to that player. So what we did was, after we created all of those fundamental services in PlayFab, we built onto it several years back at something we call PlayStream. So PlayStream is every event for your game. It doesn't matter whether it's coming from a client, from a server, from a third-party integration. They all flow into the same stream of data. As when I say stream of data, I literally mean it. This, this follows what, if you've been reading on it, what follows the, uh, the serverless so-called model of computing, which is a silly name because obviously there's a server. But the idea of the, the serverless model is, uh, let's use um, like a, a shopping store example, like, a, like Amazon or anything like that. In the old days, an old site, what you do is you would have a process that where the player is, or player, excuse me, the user is like picking an item. He picks a jacket and he says, okay, add the jacket to my cart. So in old style systems, the main site would say, okay, hey, cart, add this. The cart would say, okay, I've added it. And then you reflect that to the user. That's not how things work anymore with the serverless model. You have a flow of information, a stream. And you say, okay, let it be known that the player or user, excuse me, has added this jacket to the cart. Down the stream, there are consumers. And in our case, those consumers can do a wide range of things, which I'll, I'll show you here. 
But in the example I'm talking about with like a shopping cart system, you say, let it be known, and downstream, there's the cart, and the cart sees that event, knows that event is relevant to it, and uses it to put the information into the right place. So in our case, you can see here, all of the core events up top, things like matchmaking, you've got buying items, even just simple logins, uh, all of the things that are fundamentals to our service, the base APIs that we already make available to you have events. You don't have to send any events for those, they already happen. You can also generate custom events though, uh, in this particular example, they, there's a crash log, for example. So you could log information whenever your game has an error so that you can then track on that and do research on you know, what errors are more common and help your development team to focus on that. But as you see, it all flows into here. There's a visualization system in, play, in PlayFab that lets you then see all those events. Uh, but then they also flow through to the rules engine you see down below. The rules engine is where you can then have all of these consumers taking actions based upon the events. And then those can flow into other services, which then flow into other events, creating that loop of information about your game. How it's being played, how it's being used. So this is an example of some of the events that you might see in the game. Uh, the top one is a login event. So in this particular case, you're, the player logged in, let's see, the player is, in this case, in London. Because um, you can see the, the geo information. It, the geo lookup is done by IP address. Uh, and then in the bottom case, the event is a custom event for the game. In this case, uh, this particular game wants to track whenever a player visits their store, visits the in-game store. And you can track on custom information within these events. So you can have, you know, if you wanted to track on a uh, player killed, you could give the information about what XYZ position the player was at, what XYZ position the player who killed them was at, so that you can then create heat maps, for example. The rules engine, then, is where you build out these rules that take advantage of all these events coming into the system. So in this case, you've got a statistic changed event. So the statistic change comes in. In this case, it's bosses killed. This is actually, if I can get time for it, I'm going to go a little quickly so I can make sure you get there. Um, this particular rule is part of one of our demo games, where whenever the boss event occurs, we're actually sending an email to the player. That email contains a link, which is a deep link back into the game. So what it is, it's a reward email. Hey, congratulations, you killed the boss. Click here to get 100 gold. So the player gets the email. When they click the link, it gets back to the game. Then they get the 100 gold. So it's that flow that gets, gets, pulls the player back into the game over and over again. But you can see in the actions chart there, which I pulled up as a drop down for the purposes of showing this off, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can also send push notifications to the player. Uh, you can increment statistics, grant them currencies or items. You can even ban players if necessary. One of my customers got really excited when we first introduced the system because he had long been tracking on all the things he knew identified cheaters. So all he did was he built a rule set and said whenever this rule set is met, just ban the person. Oh, and I should also highlight, one of the ones you see on here, execute cloud script, that's probably the most powerful thing because cloud script is JavaScript hosted in our service and it will actually be offering a C-sharp option soon as well. But that is custom logic that you write, relatively lightweight logic, you know, short-lived things, that you can call from these actions and do custom things. What's that? Sure, go for it. Can I do multiple actions? Oh yeah, absolutely. What I didn't show you on your, actually, you see where it says add down at the bottom? Yeah, you can add more actions onto a single thing. Oh, you don't need to wait. So the question is, can you wait on one action to do the other action? You don't really need to. When you so okay, and the question is about you know you want to make sure that like if you grant an item to a player, the player's actually got it before you tell them they've got it. So this is all a real-time system. I should really emphasize that all these events are coming in as soon as they occur. So within you know a second, you've got the event. It hits the rule. All these things fire. When the item is granted and you're sending a push or an email to the player, it's, it's going to take longer for the push or the email to get to the player because of just internet latency than it's going to take for the item to be granted to the player. So yeah, you, know, you really don't need to worry about that. Um, but then one of the more powerful ways you can interact with your users is by having user segmentation and being able to identify all the ways that people play your games. And I mean, the goal here, one of the things that we talk about a lot is getting to this segment of one being able to have enough rich segmentation of your players that every single player gets a truly customized experience. And it's kind of a lofty goal, and you know, odds are good that you're gonna have a, a big enough user base that 
you're going to have large groups of people who have each classification of experience. But realistically, if you had a hundred different segments, the number of permutations that then falls into means that you really could, in some ways, have experiences that are truly tailored to the individual user. Um, one of the things you see on here, because if you look, you can, you can segment users on all kinds of things, and you can, to, to your point earlier about can you do multiple things, you could have five, six, seven, ten different filters on this. So your segments can be very, very tightly defined or very loosely defined, either way. Um, but like for if, I, so if I take, for example, in here, uh, total value to date in US dollars, the amount of money the person spent. For people who spend a lot of money in games, particularly free-to-play games, um, specifically, I should say, uh, they, when they go to the store, they really don't care about your 99 cent items. They want to see the $99 item that contains like a million gold and the Sword of Doom and you know, invisible plane, whatever. Um, so being able to show them a different store, not necessarily you know, varying pricing, because of course that can get you into trouble potentially, but um, although they, I talked to me afterwards, using, using variable pricing as a, an interstitial where you're offering discounts works perfectly. But um, being able to offer a different store where you're showing different items from the total list that you have is absolutely a great technique because it's, it's similar to the, like, the, store sh uh, excuse me, the grocery store eye line concept where the grocery store puts at the eye line everything they want to really sell through a lot because they make the most profit on it. But in your case, you're basically offering a different eye line to every single customer. Um, scheduled tasks then are a way to uh, create some logic that you want to run across a group of users. So in this case, you're going to, for this specific example, we're taking the, all players in the segment of active players. And active players, in this case, I think I defined it as just players who played the game within the last two days. And you're going through and you're talking about a new event, an upcoming event. It might have been like, we had a lot of titles do um, uh, St. Patrick's Day's events just recently, obviously. So you're going to pre-announce these events, let them know it's coming up so that people know, oh, there's something unique happening for the title. And you know, maybe there's some new costumes I can get, anything along those lines. Uh, you can also run a scheduled task uh, in addition to against a, a, uh, a segment. You can also run it against just the t at the title level itself. And that's how you might enable or disable these events. Because you're running it just once at the title level, changing some title data so that when players log in, they're getting new messages of the day, they're getting new information about the configuration for the game, and that's what gets used to drive the actual interaction with the player. And as you can see, these can also be set to a schedule uh, you can either set that to be like a hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or you could just set a, a cron definition of when you want these jobs to run. Okay, live events then. So obviously a big part of live ops is driving these events for your players because events and having these like periodic special periods of time where the game is a different experience is something that keeps people interested, keeps them coming back. Um, there's a lot of different ways you might focus on using events. Uh, you know, for fun, for monetization, the whole list here. Uh, honestly, a lot of events, though, are a mix of these. A lot of them are going to be in that, that bottom, the bottom bullet point, where it's really, you're doing it to increase the fun of the game, but you're also doing it because you're introducing some new content, right? So some examples of that would be like these. Um, a lot of the, the screenshots, by the way, that I use are from a game called uh, Adventure Capitalist or Adventure Communist. Um, these are games from Hyper Hippo. They've been with us for a very long time, and they've been nice enough to let us use images from their games and actually data from their games uh, when we're demoing the game, uh, demoing, excuse me, the service to, uh, to developers. But these are just some examples, like having a launch day party for your players or special days, President's Day in this case, St. Patrick's, like I said. Um, the adventure capitalist guys have been building out an event set over time where they have more and more events, and they do these, they, they repeat these events every single year. And it, it definitely, we see spikes in their usage every time one of these comes up. Uh, messaging to users, so there's many systems within PlayFab to allow you to do this. You saw that you have like push and email notifications, that you can do a scheduled task to send out messages to folks. But there's also a uh, message of the day type system in the service as well, so that you can use that to drive uh, information about upcoming events. So when people log into the game, you'll get the set of whatever the most recent uh, events are that you, the, excuse me, the most recent uh, message of the day type messages that you have public in a published state so the players can get those and you can present them to the users however you like. Uh, content, obviously we have a CDN. 
Uh, we also have title data in the system. So there's basically multiple ways in which you can deliver new content and information about the game to the users. So beyond just the message of the day title news system, you have the ability to have files. So I, I know a lot of people are Unity developers. You might use Unity asset packages as ways to deliver new content to the games. So you could deliver that through the CDN so that it gets to the users as fast as possible. Um, but there's also title data. And that's one of the most fundamental systems because that's where you can store arbitrary, uh, say, JSON data or whatever format you need uh, that contains configuration information for your game. And that's where you would then adjust that as you're doing events so that you have different information about the mechanics of the game and how they're changed based upon you know, tuning the game or based upon the events that are occurring at any given time. Um, we've got a complete store system. So in the store, you're able to define uh, products that are for sale to the players, the pricing. Uh, we integrate with receipt validation from all the major platforms, the uh, entitlement systems for the different console systems, and then we also have some, in addition, some just straight up cash purchase systems enabled like Steam Wallet, uh, PayPal, Exola, things along those lines. But you would then just define your catalog in the game. You could define various stores, and a store is a, a view of a subset of items within the catalog so that you can have that differentiation of, you might have a store for just different character classes. The fighter has one store, the cleric has another store. But you might have different stores, like I said, for players who spend different volumes of money. Somebody who's never purchased anything before, sure, show them all the 99 cent items. Somebody who spends a lot of money, no, show them the expensive items because that's what they want to see. Uh, but you can also see at the top is an example of a, the, the launch party that I was talking about earlier. During your first launch day, maybe you want to give a half off price to everybody for everything in your store. So when you uh, show these, this is an example of the, the store screen in our game manager. Uh, everything about the game you can configure through the game manager. We try to be always API first, so there are admin APIs if you want to control things through your own scripting, but the game manager is a really handy tool for do taking care of all of your configurations. So in the store, you can define the, uh, the set of items that you want to have for players and the pricing. Stores can have different pricing, obviously, so that you can have the, the variations that you're offering to people. Um, and then down at the bottom of the whole setup for the store, there's the segment override system. So when you have user segments defined, one of the things you can do is you can say, OK, so if the player's in this segment versus this segment, don't show them the base store, show them a different store. So that's specifically how you would do what I was talking about, where somebody spends a lot of money, they're in that segment of users that spends a lot of money, great. So instead of showing the base store, show the whale store for use of a better, uh, for use of a common use term that's not necessarily one that I like, but still. Okay, so that's the idea of the overall system. And it looks like I actually managed to rush that enough that I can actually show you a little bit of this in practice. So let me bounce out here. And go to my dashboard. Uh, so you can see this is the, the typical dashboard for a game. And if I load up my demo application, I go ahead and connect and play. There we go. So I've just logged in. I'm in, there you go. I'm in San Francisco. Let's look at the data for that. Okay. So there's my GPS position based upon my IP address. And if I then go in and actually play a round of the game, and obviously it's just a demo game, so it's really quick to just tell it, go do a level. Boom, there's all the data that comes through at that. And oh, there we go, I killed a boss. So it actually sent me an email. Let me go out to my email. Maybe I can make this a comp oh. oh, for God's sake. I'm sorry, guys. Let's do that again. Duplicate, there we go. Have we got it now? Why is it not showing? All right, there we go. All right, so let me just do that again. Let me back out of the game. Let me log out. All right, now, from the top. Let's connect and play. All right, there's the login. The login data showing you the GPS. Or I shouldn't say GPS, geolocation based on IP, realistically. All right, and then if I go in and play a level, There we go. Boom. Statistics. I killed another boss. Great. <laughs> I'm on a roll. Um, so you can see that all these events are happening in real time as the player is playing your game. So if I then, and I hope I get the right email account. I'm actually not sure which email account is set up for this. That's obviously not that one. So if I go to... 
here. All right, I don't want to take up too much. Oh, here it is. I actually found it. So this is the mail that was just sent to me that has my congratulations, you get 100 gold coins. So I'm going to click the deep link URL, granted 100 gold coins to the player, virtual currency balance change, there you go. So that's an example specifically of using that kind of an operation in our system to drive that experience for your player. So, okay, obviously rapid, rapid fire discussion and rapid fire demo. I wanted to squeeze a lot of information into a very short period of time. Um, we are coming up on the, the 11.15, so I just wanted to check. Are there any questions at all I can answer for you guys? I also have, I've grabbed a bunch of copies of this from our, uh, our booth to bring over. Um, let me go back to my uh, PowerPoint deck here. No. Just to talk a little bit about, excuse me. Call to action. Um, basically, yeah. The, the, the action I just would like to encourage everybody to take. Go to PlayFab and go ahead and create it for your free account. Developer.playfab.com. It's easy to set up an account. Um, creating an account automatically gets you in our free tier. So you can create a title, you can start experimenting with it. You know, use it, use it however you like. And if you've got any questions, we've got a community forum that's linked both from our developer site and from our main site. Feel free to ask any questions there. We're happy to get you all the info you need. But think through, in terms of your live op strategy, how you want to apply that to your games. What things make your game unique? What things make your game play experiences unique for your players? How they can be varied? All of that. All the things that we've been talking about here. Um, definitely, like I said, I grabbed a, a few of these to, to hand out here. Definitely, if you don't already have a copy, pick up a copy of this. This is our live ops best practices guide that we put together specifically for this conference. Um, we'll be putting it on our site later as well, but we wanted to give everybody here the opportunity to get a hold of it first. Um, and yeah, give us feedback, you know, either at the booth or online, whatever. We really want to hear from our developer community. That is specifically how we determine what our priorities are for the things we do going forward, is what we're hearing from all of you. All right, so with that, I'd, if there are no questions, all right, great. Thanks, guys.